and we're back. <laughs> uh, hi there. Welcome once again, everybody, to Cast Iron, well, Cast Iron Friday this time. Um, I had said enough times already on my uh, Facebook page and here on YouTube that unfortunately I was delayed for a whole two days this week because... <clears throat> Another one of those emergency road trips for work came up. I'm not sure if this is going to become a regular occurrence. I really hope it doesn't cause any more interruptions like this. But nonetheless, the word came out pretty much at the last minute that I needed to pack my stuff up and fly out to Cincinnati to do a uh, job. And it was pretty much, it was really a rush job, not the uh, work itself, but I mean, actually getting there and back in that I left for the airport on Wednesday evening, got uh, arrived in that uh, and checked into my hotel at a little past midnight on yesterday morning, Thursday morning, um, <clears throat> got up and uh, did the job was on site by about uh, a little past eight 30 in the morning did what needed to be done, finally was finished at like maybe about uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So I had a couple of hours to actually explore the, uh, well, the Covington area, really, more like like that. As you uh, folks who live there, as you know, it's kind of like a uh, <clears throat> tri-state and uh, at least two cities uh, in that area. Cincinnati is the most famous one, but the big airport is in Covington. Finally got on the uh, plane, uh, or rather, I got to the airport again at about five o'clock, got and the, got on the plane by about seven, and was back here uh, at home by about uh, one to two o'clock this morning. So yeah, <laughs> I've been kind of beat, <laughs> but <clears throat> this uh, I'm not here to uh, get pity from you. I'm here to cook, of course, because if nothing else, this definitely inspired me for uh, to. Um, uh, well, to uh, change the subject of uh, tonight's uh, video because it was going to be about baking. I figured I figured it should be easy enough to do a nice uh, cake, and I'm thinking that's still a good topic, which I'll probably do, well, maybe next Wednesday or so. But, however, this is another example of uh, the golden rule of what you really must do when you travel, and that, of course, is eat locally. And I found that out both the hard way and the good way. The hard way was when I was so exhausted, I pretty much just wanted to get something to eat and then head back to the airport. And uh, as far as fast food uh, chains go in the area, it was my first time trying a <clears throat> Big Boy's yesterday. And those of you who know big boys, well, let's just say I found it out. Yeah, because we don't have any of those here in the New England area. So uh, a lot of those chains out there in the Midwest, in the West and so forth, simply have not made it here to New England. We were only invaded by Chick-fil-A about uh, two to three years ago, for instance. And uh, nowhere here in New England do we have things like a Shoney's or a Waffle House or crystal. Um, <clears throat> and you're thinking, well, gee, maybe that's not so bad. Yeah. Anyway, I found that out as well about big boys. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Then we'll get down to the subject of tonight. Um, what can I say? When I tried a big boys and uh, walked in and, and I sat down and the waitress came up to me and I said, hey, I, this is my first time eating here. Tell me what to order. And she said, oh, I don't eat here. <laughs> yeah, that's a great start, isn't it? Especially since I should have taken the hint and walked right out <laughs> because I, what I ended up getting was a burger with two dried out patties that were flatter than pancakes, some uh, rather bland uh, crispy fries that look exactly like the kind you buy in the frozen food section at the supermarket, and some processed mashed potatoes with some not bad gravy. Yeah, that's not exactly an enthusiastic endorsement of big boys, I'll say that much. On the other hand, I did learn something, <clears throat> and finally we're getting down to it, to the subject of tonight's video. Um, I learned something about eating locally, and that, of course, is uh, that little uh, food secret that you folks there in Cincinnati know about, and that would be Cincinnati chili. And finally, this uh, got me so interested that, uh, yeah, I had to, uh, simply had to give this a try here. 
And so here we go at last. You think I've talked enough? <laughs> oh, so now it's time to, to say hi, everyone. Uh, Jimmy Langford, hello, Cast Iron Nation. And Jessica T, welcome back. And Bookworm73 and Gunter45. And hello, Rebecca Claycomb. Wish you stayed earlier. I had to work by 9 o'clock. Uh, I work third. Uh, oh, wish you started earlier. Well, I had to do the best I could. I know Friday evenings, I know, are really busy for everyone, I'm afraid. But, I mean, I did want to do this, and I had to choose the most convenient uh, way I could. I apologize for that, and best I can say is you can always watch this afterwards. <laughs> um, Frank Marillo, hello, hello, and Tanya Edwards. It's always nice to see folks here, especially since, again, this was not uh, when we usually do this. Okay, now, as I mentioned already, let's get down and let's start making some chili, shall we? Because, yeah, this is an unusual chili, as I found out. It has really more of a Middle Eastern flavor to it than uh, anything else. So, no, this is not a Texas chili. If you're here and you, uh, you worship Texas chili, you are probably going to be offended. Well, feel free to be a friend offended and... Feel free to post your comments here, and that should make for some interesting discussion. Anyway, here we go again. Maybe I can even bring this up a little closer here. Um, there we go. That's a little better, I think, because, yes, say hello again to a large cast iron uh, six-quart or is it seven-quart enamel Dutch oven, which I've been heating hot enough so that we can get started with the toasting some onions here. The bottom of this, unfortunately, yeah, I have stained it, and I really have to uh, make a good effort to uh, clean these stains up. But that will not stop us from cooking, at least. So, and besides, cooking is such a great stress release that I have been really looking forward to doing this, especially since this did not require a lot in the way of preparation, as I found out. All I really had to do was, well, prepare some ground beef and uh, chop up uh, some uh, garlic and some onions. Correction, chop up a lot of onions. <laughs> Again, as folks know, uh, the onions here, some of it we are going to uh, start uh, frying right now. Uh, let's turn on the fan here, too. Okay. On the other hand, I've got a bunch more onions that are going to be used afterwards for chopping the chili. Yeah, uh, this chili, as I found out, is such a tradition there in Cincinnati that, yeah, folks really, really guard their chili jealously in that if I make one, one slight mistake or difference, rather, I should say, from the way this thing is prepared, you can bet there's going to be howls of protest from this which is why I'm starting out by uh, toasting up some onions here. And as I said, there really wasn't too much in the way of ingredients, except that there is going to be a lot of spices going into this chili. And, you know, it's funny. I did do some research, which meant looking at YouTube videos. <laughs> um, try, look, uh, and it seems that several of these uh, kept saying, wow, there are a lot of ingredients on this. Boy, you would think that... Uh, with some recipes, you'd be used to uh, these kind of lists of ingredients. I didn't think this was anything out of the ordinary. And quite frankly, I had everything already here in my uh, spice cabinet. So, yeah, so this is nothing really is going to be um, really too unusual other than the combination that we're going to be using. I mean, we're going to be using a combination of cinnamon and allspice along with chili powder, cumin, and cayenne. So, yeah, that's definitely uh, an unusual combination. Anyway, all I got to do is uh, just to fry these for a, maybe a couple more minutes until these things start to get soft and more translucent. And then it's only a matter of uh, we start uh, throwing everything in. That sure wasn't, sure wasn't difficult. And what else do we have here as well? And while we're waiting, yeah. I certainly hope this is going to be epic. I'm looking forward to it myself. And 
Yeah, this is the first time I've caught you live, Rebecca Claycomb. Well, um, well, at least uh, at least we got to say hi. <laughs> uh, Josh Riston, how does the Lodge Enamel Cast Iron compare, in your opinion, to some of the more expensive brands? Uh, this, I've found, actually uh, holds up pretty darn well. Uh, for I, for a long time, I was using a Le Creuset Dutch oven, for instance, until I finally wore that one out. And I now have a Stobe uh, enamel Dutch oven as well. Oh, yeah, and that's pronounced Stobe, as I found out. I actually learned that from their own website. It's I mean, it looks like it might be Staub or Staub, but it's actually Stobe. But anyway, um, I really like this. And quite frankly, I think this is much better quality than some of those other enamel cast iron ones I've seen. Uh, for a few years, I was using a Tramontina enamel cast iron. Yeah, that's the kind, that's a brand that you can get from Walmart. That was really good, quite frankly. If you want to, uh, you know, get that brand of uh, enamel cast iron, as I said, at Walmart or wherever, I recommend it. It actually uh, lasted quite a long time. On the other hand, uh, I actually got, uh, at one point, at, uh, I think it was at uh, Marshall's or something, I found a Cuisinart uh, enamel Dutch oven. And, you know, I mean, it started out being a really nice cooker, but I found that the enamel crazed and began to uh, crack really not very long after maybe a couple of years of use or even less. Likewise, there was another brand. A uh, This one also came from a Marshall's. Uh, it was called like Chantal or something, C-H-A-N-T-A-L, which I'd never heard, but it was a nice looking uh, Dutch oven, very thin. That one also did not last very long, unfortunately. In both instances, the enamel really did not seem to hold up. On the other hand, this large Dutch oven has uh, done much better as far as I'm concerned. Uh, as I said, unfortunately, yes, as I will say that yes, the bottom is stained and um. I'm really got. I'm still trying to find a uh, the best method yet for cleaning enamel cast iron. I've tried a few, including bleaching it, and that actually seems to do a good job. I may end up doing that again. So yeah, as far as that's concerned, uh, how did you burn your pan to high temperature? Yeah, quite possibly. I wouldn't be surprised myself. So uh, it's been ten years, and yet I think I'm still making that mistake of heating the pan up too high. Um, okay, what else do we have? Yeah. <clears throat> um, nonetheless, as I say to every time, this is a uh, live chat, and I very much encourage comments pretty much of all sorts, preferably related to the topic, of course. You know, and the topic tonight is, well, enamel cast iron, and really any cast iron is always on topic, as well as chili, and I'll also throw out... A for discussion as well. If anybody wants to comment, say, for instance, on their own discoveries when they went traveling, as I mentioned already, that's one thing that really enthused me uh, to uh, try this tonight. And I think we're about ready here uh, in that, um, you know, as I said, Cincinnati chili is a local favorite, one that you really don't hear much about. I mean, I'm in Boston, the home of Boston baked beans, which they, which everybody knows worldwide. But not many people outside Cincinnati know about Cincinnati chili. And I'll come back to that in a moment, only because it's time to start throwing in some additional ingredients. And here's where the fun begins, as Han Solo said. So let's start out by throwing in some garlic. The original recipe that I used, that I saw for this, called for about a clove of garlic, which means we're using six cloves. Well, actually three, <laughs> but you know how it is. It's like, you know, in some ways, there's you can never have too much garlic. Oh yeah, and I like the smell of this already too. Huh? Yeah, this is the part where I can't wait when they develop smell vision apps over the internet. Mm. Just the onions and the garlic alone are uh, are nice. Now come the fun spices, in which we got to throw in about three tablespoons of chili powder. And, you know, I'll bet that by using a spoon, I'm probably already angering some people. In fact, this thing won't even fit in here, which means, you know what, we're going to have to eyeball it. 
So maybe about three tablespoons of chili powder. To this, we add about a, oh, I'm gonna put the cover back on. To this, we add about a teaspoon of cumin. Chili powder and cumin go really well together um, in that, yeah, everybody loves the uh, smell and the taste of chili powder, but cumin really adds a nice little background flavor to it, like a more of a meat type of flavor. So yeah, I really enjoy cumin. And then we got about a tablespoon of oregano. You know, this is all your usual stuff that you might see in chili, nothing unusual about that. However, here is where things start getting weird because now we're going to add uh, da -da, about two teaspoons of cinnamon. And once again, I'm, I'm eyeballing it. I hope that's not a mistake. Ooh, yeah, boy, actually the scent of that mixing in with the chili powder. I am already just that, just this moment. Yeah, I feel like I've had like a little bit of a revelation here. I like it. Um, then from here, we go with about a teaspoon of allspice. Yeah, allspice. Yeah, you know, the thing that most people just bring out during the holidays. <laughs> uh, allspice, and now we got to kick it up a notch. With uh, give it a little bit of kick with about half a teaspoon or so of cayenne. Don't want too much. I've never been a fan of uh, nuclear chilies that destroy your taste buds. I would rather taste it. If it's got heat, great. But I want to taste it, not just uh, you know, not just be burned. Um, now we throw in some salt. And we're going to have to get some wet ingredients in here soon enough. And as a matter of fact, now, just in time, about three cups of beef broth coming in. That is the start of our chili. And yes, this does have an interesting taste to it. I'm, a, I'm already liking this. So yeah, as I said, if you want to try something different, give this a try. I mean, as I said, there's nothing wrong with traditional barbecue type, barbecue style chili. But again, what can I say? I'm a big fan, and I've said this enough times before, too. I'm a big fan of trying new things. My mantra has always been, uh, well, not always, but for about the past 10 years, my mantra has been, if I find myself saying I've never tried this before, well, I've got to try it. And so as a result, here I am trying to make Cincinnati chili. And what else do we have here? Uh, yeah, I never go beyond medium. Oh, for the temperature, that is. Yeah, I have a nice large enamel pan, and I only cook medium at most. I agree there. Medium really is about all you need most of the time, even when you get into things like steaks. You just heat it for a long time. Uh, your fast food experience, Brian Smith, reminds me of a trip to Eugene, Oregon. I, want, I went to Jack in the Box <laughs> first and last time, and now I call it Jack in the Garbage. <laughs> yeah, I have some X-rated comments about that that will not be repeated here. <laughs> sure glad they're not in Canada. And Rebecca, again, I've never bought enameled cast iron because it just seems too expensive and fragile. There is no denying that it is more fragile. Cat, uh, enamel cast iron will not last forever. Regular bare cast iron will last forever. Yet, there are a lot of real advantages to uh, enamel cast iron, which is why I have both. And I would encourage folks to take the time and find a nice, durable, 
uh, enameled uh, cast iron uh, Dutch oven, at least one, so that you'll have be able to use the best of both worlds. Because you know, enamel has some real advantages, such as being able to cook acidic foods and cook and foods with a lot of tomatoes, which is what we're going to be making here tonight. That's why you see a lot of people make their chili in enamel cast iron. I know a lot of people make their chili in regular cast iron, but on the other hand, again, uh, if your uh, bare cast iron pan is not properly uh, seasoned and has been seasoned for a while, oh good, this is getting starting to get nice and hot now, um, then it's likely that the tomatoes will be will affect the seasoning, and you could end up getting a uh, more of a grayish color to your chili. Yeah. Yeah, background noise. Uh, as well as, uh, at worst, maybe even getting a metallic taste to it. So uh, for that reason, at least enameled cast iron is really good for making uh, tomato dishes. I use it all the time, especially for making my grandmother's pasta sauce. And what is the best brand and at an affordable price? Well, I think I mentioned the two that I like. One, Yes, Lodge Cast Iron. I do feel it is a really, really good brand, about the about the best you can get, really, at a reasonably affordable price. On the other hand, even though it's an Asian-made brand, well, technically all enamel cast iron is made out of, outside the USA. But uh, the Tramontina enamel uh, cast iron uh, pot that they sell at Walmart, for instance, is a very good bargain, and you will get a lot of use out of it, and it will last a long time. And that's another brand I think I would indeed encourage folks to try if they want to, uh, if they want to, uh, well, give it a try. And meanwhile, at this point, now that we've got this part going, let's see, our next step here. Oh, yes, that's right. We have to bring out the uh, secret ingredient, which I've been keeping in the refrigerator. Not sure if you've heard that. The secret ingredient to Cincinnati chili. Chocolate. <laughs> uh, yeah, this apparently is a big deal. And in fact, I considered, uh, yeah, they said to use unsweetened uh, chocolate. And that's what I have here. I considered using uh, some cocoa powder because I have cocoa powder. But again, None of the recipes I saw said to use cocoa powder. They all said to use actual chocolate. So, like I said, especially since this is my first time making Cincinnati chili, I'm not going to go against tradition, folks. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, okay. That means we get to throw in. I believe it's the big thing is about a square of chocolate and in we go Plop. this is unsweetened unfortunately i can't nibble on this because you know unsweetened chocolate is too bitter it's really there for cooking and that's about it but nonetheless in it goes and that sure disappeared pretty fast too didn't it yeah, this melted, melted really fast. It's already gone. Well, at least that shows this is hot enough. Okay, from here, now that we've done that, uh, a few more wet ingredients here. And that is, um, did always forget something. In this case, I forgot to open up a couple of cans. We've got a can of tomato paste and then a can of tomato sauce coming in. Um, yeah, tomato paste does have a, a different taste. I will certainly agree there, as well as its own consistency. Oops, uh, this will go. And I like the fact that this thing calls for a one six ounce can because, you know, it's really tough to uh, just use maybe half of one of these things. Uh, once you do that, it all the rest of it always ends up sitting in the refrigerator for about two weeks or more. <laughs> so I'm glad that I'm supposed to be using all of it. However, yeah, I, I, as I said, I'm really digging the smell of this. Dig it, man. <laughs> but yeah, I'm really enjoying the smell of this. It's um, just based on the smell alone, I'm recommending. Yeah, I'd say again, folks, give this a try. This, again, is one of those um, 
local secrets that they don't tell us folks about, except when we actually come to town. So, give that a try. Okay, that's that. Then next, we throw in about two tablespoons of vinegar. Good old apple cider vinegar. I love this stuff. I could practically drink it on its own. Oh, yeah, this is definitely giving us really a unique flavor. And when I say unique, I mean that in a good way. I'm not saying it's unique. No, this is definitely, really, this is coming together. You know, it's like one of those things that I don't think you could say you've ever smelled before. Especially even the uh, scent of the chocolate in the midst, in the background. So, yeah, I'm... I can only agree so far with what I've seen about uh, with those uh, videos in which people are going crazy over this thing, over this stuff. I can see why they've got at least two whole uh, restaurant chains there in um, in um, Cincinnati that uh, that really specialize in chili. One of them, probably the more famous one, is Skyline Chili. The other one, which I saw, I wish I had gone into, was one called Gold Star Chili both of which are famous in that area and have become quite institutions uh, on their own. Anyway, that's mixed in nicely. And then from there, we got about, it says about one and a half cups of uh, tomato sauce, which I'd say is probably about the right size for your typical 15-ounce uh, can. Notice, it, notice how, you know, these things are no longer 16-ounce cans. They're now 15-ounce cans. And that, of course, is an infamous marketing tool that, uh, that some people call the grocery shrink ray, how over the years, sizes of these uh, think containers have been very slowly shrinking. Anyway, this is tomato sauce to go with that uh, tomato paste. And yeah, I know, I suppose you could use regular, you know, ground tomatoes as well, which is traditional for using in chili. But as I said, I'm trying to be traditional to the recipe. If I'm doing it wrong, please tell me, anyone. I am very much open to criticism, and I would love to hear it. Still, we've got a nice base for our chili here. Also, it's interesting. You notice, by the way, how um, we're supposed to do it in this manner. We're supposed to make all of this together into a sauce, and then we're going to add the ground beef. Uh, the recipe does not even say to brown the ground beef, which is something that you would expect to do. But nope, you just simply add the uh, raw ground beef to all this, mix it in, and let it simmer. So, now that we've gone this far, uh, Henry W., mine is awesome for sausages for breakfast for include or for inclusion of spaghetti sauce, also frying eggs and a bit of avocado oil. That would be an enameled cast iron pan, and I have no arguments there. Somebody says, I've had a juicer for about 40 years. <laughs> it only says on the sides, ACO. I know very, I know nothing about, oh, that's what you're talking about, I guess. Uh, I know really nothing about a cast iron juicer. <laughs> that, sorry about that. Do you ever add chocolate to your tomato dishes? Um, I have seen other recipes, even for chili, even outside of Cincinnati, where they do recommend adding chocolate to it. Uh, this is my first time adding chocolate. So, yeah, I'm really liking that. I'm trying this for the first time. <clears throat> And what else? Okay, we've gone this far. Okay, beyond here, what else? Uh, da, 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 brown sugar. Oh, yeah. Now, finally, we threw in a bit of sweetness and a bit of savory. And then comes the uh, ground beef itself. For the sweetness, I throw in a little bit of brown sugar, which is actually a traditional... Um, you know, what you often see in uh, a lot of barbecue sauce recipes. Remember, there's cayenne in there, too. So there will still be a bit of heat. And in addition, for more savory, 
got to throw in some Worcestershire, Worcestershire, Worcestershire sauce. And yes, I do know how to pronounce Worcestershire. Worcestershire. Hmm. Uh, I, I grew up on Lee and Perrins. As far as I'm concerned, Lee and Perrins is the only Worcestershire sauce. Everything else is an imitation. Yeah, getting so brand specific here in this channel, aren't I? <laughs> No, I'm not being paid to uh, promote any of these things. I have I use these brands because I like them. I grew up with Lee and Perrins, for instance. <clears throat> I love Lodge Cast Iron. I've had a lot of great experience with it. I highly recommend Lodge Cast Iron. Heck, even this, uh, this uh, spatula I'm using here, I paid $2 for this at Family Dollar. This was a couple of years ago, and this is a nice, thick uh, wooden spatula, which is the other thing, of course, about enamel cast iron. All never use metal utensils with enamel cast iron because you don't want there to be the chance you could scratch the enamel. I always use wooden utensils with, my, with enamel. Fortunately, even cheap wooden utensils like this work just fine. However, at this point, we've got a nice base for our chili here, which means now time to throw in some ground beef. Yeah. No, I did not grind it myself this time. I've been away for a couple of days, so yeah, I, I did have to cut corners somehow. Besides, there's really nothing wrong with uh, store-bought ground beef. Almost nothing. Plop. Plop. This is good old 80-20 ground beef. And again, doing research on this thing, I learned, um, how many pounds was that? Uh, da, 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 um, just making sure I'm throwing in enough here. This was about three and a half, okay. So that means I could throw in maybe a little bit more to make it two. That should be enough. Uh, this is 80-20 uh, ground beef, and here again, as far as Cincinnati chili is concerned, I find that um, there are a lot of arguments over the proper way to make this chili, one of which is, do you skim out the fat or not? Because again, this is 80-20, and uh, there, there will be some fat in it because of that. Some folks like to skim out the fat as it uh, rises to the surface. Others prefer to just mix it in. And my understanding is the commercial chains, you know, such as Gold Star or, or Skyline, they mix the fat in. They don't take the time to uh, drain it out. So I'm thinking that's what we will do here. I save a little bit of effort. Still, this looks pretty good already, doesn't it? Because now at this point, if I'm seeing this right, da -da 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 -da, yep. All we have to do is bring this to a boil, then lower it to a simmer, or bring it to a simmer, either way you want, and simmer it. One recipe supposedly is only about 40 to 45 minutes. Another says an hour to an hour and a half. I think it depends on how much liquid is in this thing. This actually looks pretty thick right now, so I'm betting I'm not going to have to uh, simmer this very much. However, I'm going to have to cover this right now so that we can at least bring this to a boil first. And I'm hoping that doesn't take very long. Okay. Ah. There's a nice plug right there for large cast iron. <laughs> okay. Chocolate cut the acidity of the tomatoes. I also add a little sugar. Yes, and that was the recipe did call for adding in some brown sugar for that reason to help uh, cut out the uh, acidity. <laughs> Just looked up Tramontina. Costco has a two pot set for $69, seven and four quart. That's a nice deal. Um, I got my uh, Tramontina, uh, I think it was a seven quart pot. Uh, boy, we're talking like almost 10 years ago, and I don't have it now, actually. But um, I think I paid $40 for it. Yeah, as I said, I got I got a few years of really good use out of that Tramontina pot before I felt it was time to uh, go for something else. And that was when I looked around, and after trying those um, 
uh, that Chantal and that Cuisinart, I ended up sticking with Lodge. So, but as I said, I mean, I would still say, yes, give the, give the Tramontina a try. I don't think you will regret it if you can afford it. I'm not asking you to blow your budget for it. And Rebecca Claycomb, does anyone know if you can order from Costco without a membership? I don't have an answer for that. Remember what I said about chains not making it here to New England? Costco is one of them. I have yet to see a Costco. We have BJ's here in uh, New England and uh, some Sam's Club, but not too many. What's that? I heard something. But uh, that was uh, about it. Excuse me one second. Sorry, I was checking on the cats and seeing how they were doing. Anyway, um, so if anybody can answer Rebecca Clay, Rebecca's uh, question, uh, can you order from Costco without a membership? <clears throat> if not, I guess we'll have to bite the bullet and go to Walmart, I suppose. TJ Maxx gets in Lodge enamel Dutch ovens for about $30 sometimes. Yes, they do, and I have seen them there. Anyway... Having uh, done this, while uh, as we are uh, seasoning this here, we are going to go to our next step, and that would be to prepare uh, some pasta to go with this. Um, I all, yeah, the other thing is I'm also going to uh, do some hot dogs as well. I, I figure it might as well go the distance and uh, make some uh, pasta to go with this chili. And yeah, I think some folks are saying, what? Pasta? And on the other hand... Um, the more traditional, we'll do uh, chili dogs. And that's something I learned as well, is that one of the, uh, is that the right way to serve Cincinnati chili is over spaghetti. Yeah, because the chili actually is kind of like a sauce, or you might say a bolognese, so that you uh, just uh, do some uh, plain, some, uh, um, yeah, some plain cooked spaghetti. You top that with the, um, <clears throat> with the chili, Top that with some onions, and then you drown it in sh in cheddar cheese. Oh yeah, I, I'm sure everybody will hate that part. <laughs> so yes, uh, I'm rich. Uh, Busta base. I've had Cincinnati chili in Cincinnati before. It didn't do anything for me. I'm a purist. When I eat pasta, I want spaghetti sauce. When I'm eating chili, I want beans. <laughs> and I will not deny this is different, which is the main reason why I'm giving this a try here, because, uh, <clears throat> again, I very much want, am interested in uh, trying new things here, and this is hardly the first time I've done so either. Let me check this. Let's see how this is doing at this point. Uh, not boiling yet. Uh, I could think of uh, some other instances, even recently, when I've uh, discovered local foods and just had to give them a try. A couple of years ago, again for work, they sent me to South Carolina, and it was down there that I discovered their local uh, their local specialty, and that, of course, would be South Carolina barbecue hash. It is like a second cousin to the more famous Brunswick stew, in which you put tons and tons of meat into a pot and boil it all until it uh, really falls apart, and uh, yeah, you throw in a lot of tomatoes. And uh, also the secret, though, to South Carolina barbecue hash is a lot of mustard. They have a special bar barbecue sauce that is really, really heavy on the mustard. And you serve it over rice. And in South Carolina, you can go to a lot of places and get some hash and rice, for instance. Outside of South Carolina, you ask for hash and rice, and people will go, What? <laughs> so much like Cincinnati chili, that's what they have down there in South Carolina. I can also think uh, several times I visited my friends in New York State. And when I went to Binghamton, New York, which is a big city on the border of uh, New York to uh, Philadelphia, not Philadelphia, to Pennsylvania, uh, Bingham Binghamton has a very famous local sandwich, the Speedy, which is a very specialized kind of a chicken sandwich in that chicken, uh, the chicken before cooking is marinated in a uh, special sauce, which includes a fair amount of vinegar to it. And that is fried and served, especially by street vendors. 
and I was forced to try a speedy sandwich in when I went to uh, Binghamton. And ever since then, I just have to have one <laughs> whenever I go back there. That's why I love eating locally. You never know what you're going to find. <clears throat> As I said already, I'm uh, from Boston, the home of Boston Baked Beans, and I have had some fun Rivalries, fun as in a good way, as in a humorous and funny way. Uh, rivalries with with a couple of friends of mine uh, down in Texas over our Boston baked beans. I know one guy I who calls himself the deep fried king. He laughs at our Boston baked beans and calls it candy because we use so much brown sugar and molasses in it. Um, I had a cook-off with him over YouTube, and if you look in the early days of my uh, channel, you will see my uh, cook-off with the deep-fried king over beans. He made his what he called his Texas version of baked beans, and I made Boston baked beans. Mm. Um, so, yeah, as far as, sp as far as eating locally goes, well, that's why here in New England that's very easy to do. And on the other hand, if you go down south, needless to say, just about every family... <clears throat> has their own secret chili recipe, which may very well be why, dude, bust a base, you, oh, what's this? Chuck Miller, oh, $5 donation. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, I said before, you know, I'm really not asking for these donations, but I mean, I, but I, I won't say no. I mean, I very much appreciate it. Um, I'll get into that part a little bit later. But Chuck Miller says Cincinnati chili needs to be made in either a Wagner Dutch oven or a BSR Dutch oven. No exceptions. Um, I can see why. I mean, uh, Wagner, of course, comes from Ohio and Cincinnati's in Ohio. Of course, BSR, on the other hand, comes from the south. And BSR has been a competitor, was a competitor to Lodge until they went out of business. So. So, unfortunately, this is being made in a large Dutch oven, and I'm afraid we do have an exception to it. <laughs> so, but uh, thank you for the comment, uh, Chuck Miller. Um, and this kind of lost, lost my train of thought here. Oh, yeah, that's right. I said before, um, when you get, especially if you head down south, not only does every town and state, but every family has their own secret chili recipe which may very well be why Busta Base here said that he wasn't impressed by Cincinnati chili. Well, no, this is definitely different, and you really have to kind of like open your mind to it, you know, realize that you're not having your traditional barbecue chili here. This is something different, and let's see. Oh, good. It looks like we're at this simmering point now. So... That means we've got to thicken this, and that means I get to leave the cover off and turn this down a bit to a simmer and let it simmer. Um, we'll see what this thing's like in about 45 minutes or so. I'm hoping it's thickened enough by then. Let me put this, uh, uh, this cover down. And then from there, we will get down to the second step of our uh, little shoe tonight. <clears throat> and that, as I mentioned, is preparing some pasta to go with this. And actually, I'm hoping this help, This makes uh, Chuck Miller feel a little better because uh, the pasta is going to be prepared. Okay, turn, turn the temperature on. Pasta is going to be prepared in a Wagner Magnolite um, Dutch oven. So we are using Mag Wagner, at least, as far as the uh, pasta is concerned. I have said some uh, things. Oh, and for that matter, the skillet here what is, in fact, a BSR. This is uh, the class my uh, classic BSR lightning skillet, as I call it, which is a Red Mountain number seven. I'll get into that in a little bit as well. I'm going to crack it. I'm going to watch myself for that. Oh, yeah, that's right. Gotta salt the water. Duh. <coughs> There's plenty of time. That's why I didn't uh, boil this in advance. Throw some salt in. Come on. Whoa, sh oh, crap. Okay, my bad. Now I am gonna have to. Uh, <laughs> there you go. <sighs> All right, so much for that. 
unfortunately, that only happened at the beginning. That's the type of thing you only see on live videos. You don't see that on those uh, edited, pre-made uh, videos. <laughs> you think that water might have been a little bit salty? All right. Take two. There we go. Take two. This time, I don't think I'll just dump it in. How about that? <laughs> there we go. That's the amount of salt I wanted. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm laughing. I mean, what can I do? It's like... Yeah, I'm laughing. I mean, what can I do? It's like I made a little mistake. It happens. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, as XJ Slow said, oh, for low says, whoops. <laughs> I've sampled uh, Busta Bass. I've sampled dishes all over the world and fully understand the cultural diversity and regional cuisine. Doesn't mean I have to like it. No, you don't have to like it. I'm not insisting that you have to like everything. I mean, that's obviously your own uh, personal choice. Oh, yeah. It would help if I covered this to bring it to a boil. Everybody has their own uh, tastes and their own choices. There's no denying that. I mean, heck, me... Uh, for instance, I have never been a big fan of drinking coffee. All my life, for whatever reason, the taste of coffee just has not appealed to me. I am not uh, dissing anybody else's uh, choice in coffee. I am just have never been a coffee drinker for that reason. Likewise with beer. I cannot stand the taste of beer. Yet, in the past few years, I've really learned that cooking with beer is really, really good. Or at least some kinds of beer. Everybody has their own uh, their own tastes. Will not deny that. Nonetheless, Buster Base, I hope you don't mind, uh, and I appreciate you sticking around for that. <laughs> anyway, okay. While we're at it, as I mentioned, well, let's go in a little bit more about uh, an old cast iron, I guess, because again, oh, we get some nice steam coming up from this. That's good. Uh, this is the Lodge enameled uh, cast iron Dutch oven, which in fact is made in Asia. And that has been a point of contention for folks who uh, only insist on buying made in the USA. That unfortunately is the case because uh, with one small exception, only within the last year or so, all enameled cast iron has been made outside the USA and has been for decades. There are no makers of enamel cast iron uh, left in the USA, and that includes Lodge. Lodge does have to have their uh, enameled uh, cast iron made in China, and they do this according to their own specific standards. So they have very strict quality standards, and uh, that's why I'm not going to uh, shirk that. And it is good quality stuff. I, as I said already, I'm very, I very much like this uh, large Dutch oven. Uh, the uh, question of Asian versus American cast iron is one that comes up very often, to which my, com my response to that is a lot of that has to do with politics, not with cooking. So I'll argue over the politics about it another time. Right now, nonetheless, though, as I said, um, again... Uh, just about any enameled uh, cast iron, and that includes the Tramontina. Yes, on the other hand, there are European-made cast iron as well, especially the French ones, namely like Le Creuset and Stobe, which are, of course, far, far more expensive. <laughs> and so it goes. <laughs> but even so... Um, as I said already, um, I regularly make uh, pasta sauce in my uh, enameled uh, cast iron. And this, as I said, is going to be something of a bolognese, or at least I hope it will. 
And yeah, I'm definitely uh, looking forward to it for that reason. On the other hand, as I mentioned already, this is a uh, Wagner Magnolite aluminum a Dutch oven, which I found now. God, it's already been about two years. I guess it has. <laughs> uh, I found that at Brimfield, in fact, about two years ago. And since then, it has become one of my favorite kitchen items sim simply because this is about the best water boiler I have ever owned. I mean, this aluminum pot does a fantastic job of boiling water. It's like it's going to be, let me turn this up a little bit. Uh, it's going to bring that, uh, that pot of water to a boil with no difficulty at all. I, I was very impressed by that. And for that reason, I mean, as I said, I would certainly recommend a uh, an aluminum pot, especially if you want to, uh, you know, especially if you for uh, making um, just that, for making pasta and other boiled dishes. On the other hand, as I said already, speaking of Wagner and BSR, here will be uh, the other uh, pan that uh, we'll be using tonight. Uh, it's got some flecks of salt in it right now. Um, and this, again, is a uh, BSR uh, Red Mountain series, uh, number seven. It's one of the, their older handwritten pans, in fact, and it's, uh, has some, um, casting flaws on the surface that look like cracks, but they are not. These things are only just really little ripples on the, uh, bottom on the surface here. Uh, the inside on the other hand is completely smooth and no, those are definitely not cracks for that reason. This is an excellent cooker. Also, for whatever reason, this particular pan, this number 7P BSR Red Mountain, I find does an awesome job of heating up and cooking. It really, I've done steaks and other things with that, and it really does it with at lightning speed, which is why I've given that pan the nickname Lightning especially since it's, uh, well, besides it looks like it has lightning uh, sparks on it as well. So, yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to uh, doing some hot dogs in that. Speaking of chili, um, as I mentioned, everybody has their own, yeah, arguments over uh you know the different kinds of chili and this is so unusual and in fact that comes down to what busta base even said when i have chili i want it with beans <laughs> well guess what as a matter of fact although i don't have beans i find that there is an option to serving cincinnati chili that does have beans because here's where uh pe where the funny part comes in with cincinnati chili i found out that they serve they serve these things <clears throat> You, when you have this, you can have it in a three-way, a four-way, or a five-way. So, yeah, if you want to uh, get together with your friends and have a four-way, <clears throat> just order up some of the Cincinnati chili. What this means is uh, that the uh, ingredients you have in this dish, well, not ingredients, but more like the combinations. A three-way, which is probably the bare minimum for this, would be you start with uh, the pasta, and then you layer on the chili, that's number two, and then you layer on the cheese, and that's number three, and so that's a three-way. A four-way, which is what we're gonna be doing tonight, is where you do the pasta, and then the uh, chili, and then the onions, and then the cheese, so that's four ways. On the other hand, there is even a five-way, or for that matter, if you do a four-way, you can substitute the onions for, as I found out, red beans. So that means uh, a four-way would be the chili, no, the uh, pasta, the chili, the beans, and then the cheese. And finally, the five-way, which has all five of those. Hmm. So yeah, this thing is uh, simmering quite nicely, which again shows you how well a large enamel uh, cast iron pot will uh, do a uh, bean dish like this. Bean dish, beef dish, chili. It is still watery, but oh yeah, man, does this have a nice aroma to it though. I'm definitely looking forward to this. No question about it. On the other hand, all we gotta do is wait for the uh, water to boil and then we will be able to move on and make ourselves some pasta. Let's break out spoon for that. Oh, here's a good one for that. <laughs> 
Um, I guess I should probably comment as well about uh, making pasta. Um, as I mentioned, uh, I'm using an aluminum pot because I find this is a wonderful water boiler, but there's no reason why you can't use your typical stainless steel pot or even cast iron. Uh, I, I have made uh, cast, I have made pasta in an, in an enameled cast iron pot and sometimes even in a bare cast iron pot. If you boil water too much in a bare cast iron pot, that can affect the seasoning. Oh, look at that. It's boiling now already. Nice. So that means we can go on to the next step here. It also means I got to remember this pot holder. And there we go. Now comes the, sp the paschetti. Any kid will tell you it's paschetti. All right, here we go. So here, now notice as well, I did not break the pasta. There is no need to break your spaghetti, even now, as you can see. Uh, all I'm doing is stirring it gently, and it is starting to bend on its own as it softens. So that, no, there is no need to break your pasta. Do not break your pasta. It, it accomplishes nothing. About the only thing breaking your pasta will do is it will uh, give you twice as many smaller pieces, which, yeah, can be helpful for serving ki to kids. And if you're trying to keep your kids from slurping their pasta, I suppose smaller uh, pieces of pasta spaghetti will certainly help. On the other hand, it does not improve the flavor, and for that matter, it does not even cook, it, cook faster. So there's really no other reason, I should say, to, uh, break, to break your pasta. The other thing is, when this is done, do not rinse the pasta. Let me repeat that. Do not rinse the pasta. Let me emphasize that. Never rinse your pasta. I have actually spoken with people who think that after you've gone through all this uh, necessity, all of this really, uh, not hard, but all of the effort of producing some really good tasting pasta, you have to douse it with cold water, which will turn it into a mush. It'll also remove the starch from the surface. Yeah, that's the other thing, notice. All I did was salt the water. I did not add uh, oil to the water. Adding oil to your pasta water, as I've, as I've found out, some may disagree, I do not see any use to it. Uh, supposedly, the oil keeps the pasta from sticking, right? Well, as you can see, if you stir this, this is not really having any trouble sticking at all. And then after that, after it comes out of the water, you don't want it to stick. You want to be sure that the, that the sauce will adhere to the pasta. And so if you've got it coated in oil, there's less chance that the uh, sauce will properly soak in and adhere to the pasta. Besides, what you really want is that starchy pasta water. That stuff is like liquid gold. So uh, there you go. There's some uh, base. There's my lessons that I learned from experience on making pasta. Don't salt the water. Don't break the pasta. Don't rinse the pasta and finally don't rinse the pasta get the idea <laughs> uh, my mom used to tell a story that i barely remember but she says there was a time when i was about nine to ten years old when i burned spaghetti before it even came out of the water seems that I completely forgot a uh, particular ingredient called stirring and the entire thing just stuck to the uh, pan even while it was in the water and so as a result it had a big uh, it had really the uh, entire bottom of the pan and probably the sides as well were coated with burned pasta and well, me being a kid, I'm guessing I just walked away and probably let it sit there for an hour or more with, the, with it going. So it probably dried off as well. But anyway, <laughs> I like to think I've learned a little bit since then. In regards to this particular chili, I'm told this is one of those times 
when you really do want to take the pasta past al dente. So I will just keep, make a note of that. I'm not going to turn this into mush, but I will uh, just wait and see until I feel it is uh, properly done. Also, I did not cover this again after I put the uh, pasta in the water. It's largely because you know if you do if you uh, cut after you cut after you first add the pasta to the water, well, of course there is the uh, risk of a boil over. You know all of that starchy foam that uh, builds up when you uh, first added it first add the pasta. Besides, this looks like it's cooking pretty nicely. So does this for that matter. I do believe it is actually starting to reduce as well. If you look around the sides, you can see there is already a little bit of a ring of um, whiteness, I guess you could say, uh, over the uh, top. And so I would think that means that the surface level is actually starting to go down. So this stuff really is reducing. So I'm happy about that. On the other hand, you can see that it is also, uh, you know, I think we are in fact getting some fat here. So, as I said, I will do what they do in the restaurant chains there. I will not skim out the fat. I will just mix it in. Let's do this right, shall we? Still, I am definitely looking forward to this. And while we're doing this, I should probably start the other part, which would be heating up the BSR. <clears throat> Careful here. Yeah. There we go. And what else do we have here? Uh, Rebecca Claycomb, there, is always, uh, there has been research that links aluminum to Alzheimer's. There was research that linked aluminum to Alzheimer's. That is true. A few studies way back in the 1970s, we're talking almost 50 years ago, suggested there may have been a link to uh, uh, between aluminum and Alzheimer's. Since then, not just scientists, but I should say researchers really worldwide have spent the past maybe 40 to 50 years look, trying to uh, lock down any possible link between aluminum and Alzheimer's, and they have not found any. Almost 50 years of, um, of uh, further follow-up research really have pretty much discredited the link between aluminum and Alzheimer's. So for that reason, it, it, we can safely say, and not just me, but if you, uh, but I actually have a video, in fact, where I look into this, you know, and in that video, I provide references. That's the key part. So I will say aluminum is safe for cooking and it does not cause Alzheimer's. Again, please feel free to look it up and especially follow the references in that video because that's the thing. There are scaremongers today, especially today on the internet where there are scaremongers for anything that keep touting those studies from almost 50 years ago and completely ignoring the following up studies that have not been able to prove any kind of a link. So uh, don't worry at all about that, Rebecca. I'm being, I hope I'm being polite and I'm definitely being honest. I'm not, you know, I'm not any kind of a paid shill or anything like that. I'm speaking the truth in that I will say aluminum is safe for cooking. So go ahead and get yourself an aluminum pot and use it to uh, boil your pasta. Meanwhile, we've got... Hmm, uh, Hermacy, it is really a, require, a required taste. I think you mean a acquired taste. Uh, we have a grocery store here that sells cans of Cincinnati chili sauce. Oh, that sounds interesting. Connie Tom, as a Cincinnati native, I can tell you Skyline Chili does not put any form of chocolate in their chili. Huh, really, that's surprising. Uh, Chuck Miller, hot dogs are linked to Alzheimer's. Every, <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Every Alzheimer's patient ate hot dogs. Yep. You could say that, yes. <laughs> and that is how conspiracy theories are born. <laughs> hot dogs. Oh, yeah. And then, of course, we could talk about hot dogs as well. Oh, oh I got to keep stirring that pasta. Sorry. <laughs> I don't 
don't want it to burn while it's still in the water. But, yeah, hot dogs, of course, are infamous in themselves. You know, oh, my God, you know what's in hot dogs? Pink slime. It's got intestines, and it's got feet, and it's got all kinds of grody things. To which my reply to that is, yes, it does. That's why we eat them. That's why they were made. Hot dogs are really just a kind of sausage. And, yes, they do or can contain things like uh, combinations and so forth. To which I say, so what? Nobody is dying from hot dogs or, well, let's try it another way. Uh, hot dogs are one of those more, one of those foods that are best in moderation. You know, if you live on hot dogs, yeah, you could probably end up developing some kind of uh, problems, uh, health problems, but that's not because of the hot dogs, but rather just because you've not been eating healthy. <laughs> which is why I'm not worried at all about some hot dogs. This is probably almost done at this point. Meanwhile, I think we can still see that this uh, chili is indeed reducing. And I'm quite happy about that. Yeah, you can see the uh, chunks of burger in the, chi in the chili now. So, yeah, we are doing pretty good here. Let's break up some of these bigger pieces here because, of course, we also have to be sure that it's properly cooked. And once again, I appreciate everybody for uh, stopping by, and I do hope you find this topic to be interesting enough to, well, watch. <laughs> and as they often say, like and subscribe and all that. So, <laughs> and I very much appreciate everybody who has done that. But what I'm really appreciating is how well this sap uh, I think this uh, chili is turning out. Oh, the smell is like, oh, it's really something you really need to try. Even if you don't want to taste it, you got to smell this. You know, it's a combination of the meat and the chili as well as the uh, sweetness. The cinnamon, you, you can taste it, but it doesn't overwhelm it. So, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this. And, Rebecca, thank you for clearing that up. I was not aware of the follow-up research. I've often avoided aluminum. Well, the, the best I could say is that uh, don't really, there is honestly no need to be afraid. I am not a doctor. I am not any kind of an expert. But I will indeed point you to real experts who will, who will indeed uh, note that uh, aluminum is safe. So, please, so there's no need to worry. And you'll find most of the ones who are still trying to scare us about uh, aluminum and Alzheimer's are also the ones who are trying to scare us about chemtrails and about GMOs and basically anything natural. No, anything that isn't natural and expensive <laughs> is bad for you. And I do not subscribe to that. Okay, it's definitely time, I think, to drain this pasta here. <clears throat> So, give me one moment, please, folks. This is here, too. Time to take, time to drain the pasta. Ah. Means we get to go over here. Ah. Here we go. Now I think I'll cover it just so that it doesn't dry out. The heat is off, and because aluminum conducts heat so well, that means it should not overcook or burn it. It should uh, just uh, do just be just enough to keep it warm. This stuff is really uh, turning out nicely, I think. From what I understand, it does have to be a little bit more dry than this, though. So all we can do is uh, keep on going. Holy cow, have we already been here in an hour and 10 minutes? <laughs> Boy, the time flies.
on one hand, I like it when the time flies. On the other hand, I'm hoping this doesn't take too much longer. Okay, but nonetheless, let's get on and uh, let's do some hot dogs, shall we? Oh, yeah, nice. <laughs> and now that we've done that... My little secret for cooking hot dogs in cast iron. Well, it's not much of a secret. But uh, how am I going to do this? Okay, let's move over slightly. Uh, there we go. That's, that's a pretty good view right there. Uh, always. Uh, Always forget something. My favorite way to cook hot dogs has been in butter. And yeah, I know that hot dog video has uh, is like what number three, number two on on the on the channel. <laughs> no, not quite that much, unfortunately. Number two is that video, <laughs> the one that tells, shows you how to use a can opener. <laughs> I still can't believe that. It's like I have made cakes, I've made steaks, I've made roasts, I've made stews, and the and the video that really took that really took off on my channel was that one, the two minute video thing on on using a can opener. <laughs> I'm not complaining. I mean, it's it's uh, generated a lot of views, and I do enjoy the fact that people have are have in fact done that. I have in fact watched. And here are our unhealthy hot dogs. Am I crowding the pan? <laughs> One other thing about cooking hot dogs is you do want to quickly do some little slits in them because when these things cook, they will expand. And if you don't put slits in there uh, in the skin, they will burst. They'll still taste okay, but yeah, I mean, obviously people would prefer hot dogs that, well, aren't burst. All we need are a couple of these little slits here. And that should be enough to let out the pressure or the steam or whatever you call it. Like I said, this pan, this is why I call this pan lightning. This is not going to take long at all. Hot dogs are pre-cooked anyway. All you really have to do is just heat them up. But especially if you heat them up in this manner by uh, frying them in butter, as you can see. And yes, I know that's not healthy. I'm not denying that. But by you know doing this, doing it this way in butter, all I can say is you will never, ever be satisfied ever again with boiled hot dogs. Yeah, that was how we, how I ate hot dogs for most of my life, and how we always made them in my family. We boiled them until I started learning how to cook, and I learned how wonderful it is to have fried hot dogs. Highly recommend it. Whether you're using fancy hot dogs or even cheap hot dogs. I've said in another video, I like dollar store hot dogs. There, I've said it. I like the Bar S brand hot dogs. I like the taste of them. I think they, I, I do. And so especially when they're made this way, a nice, cheap, and very tasty um, meal. As you can see, this is not taking long at all, is it? 
Meanwhile, let's get back here. Oh boy, this thing is definitely stirring up nicely at this point. Let's move this over a little bit yet. There we go. I think we've got a nice view here. This is definitely reducing. I'm quite happy with this. I'm hoping, like maybe in another, I don't know, 10 minutes or so, it'll all be done. That'll be nice. The other thing I did see, some of these videos, the um, it seemed like the chili turned out what looked like a little dry. I know this is still too much liquid in it, and I am doing my best to try to reduce it right now. But it's definitely reduced. So we are making progress, and I appreciate, as always, everyone who has watched it. Back to the hot dogs. Yeah, these hot dogs here really is like, this is the type of thing you should, and I know I should too, encourage your kids to try this. I mean, get them cooking early, and they will be cooking their whole lives. Also... You can tell your you could tell them as well, especially if you have boys. Girls go gaga for for a guy who cooks. But this is not taking long at all, is it? I mean, all you really have to do again is keep an eye on your kid, you know, so that they don't burn themselves. But as you can see, all the all I'm doing is pushing them back and forth. The pan is doing all the work. Maybe I'll move these over a little bit. Yeah, there we go. There we go. And while we're waiting, let me quickly check a couple of comments here. Yeah, Cincinnati chili is not supposed to be sweet. Well, no, that's why that was unsweetened chocolate, and that's why there's cayenne in it, and that's why there's also, uh, well, the chili itself. So, uh, yeah, no, this is not so much sweet. It's kind of like a savory sweet. As I said at the beginning of this video, I am not a fan of nuclear chili. You know, the kind where they throw in these the million-level uh, peppers that will destroy your taste buds in five seconds and set your entire uh, digestive system on fire. I've never been a fan of really, really heavy spices like that. And um, <clears throat> let's see, no chili Cincinnati or otherwise is supposed to be sweet. And here's hoping that this isn't sweet, so to say. I would also never add sugar to chili, but there must be people that do. <laughs> I like bar S better than Nathan's. Nathan's are too salty. I, I agree with you there, Chuck Miller. And Cincinnati chili is not spicy hot either. No, it is not. Again, it is a very specialized taste. This is one that, yes, you do have to open your mind for and expect something different. If you, As I said, if you go to this chili and you expect your typical Texas-style barbecue chili, I have no doubt you'll be disappointed. Me, I am enjoying this, the, just the scent of this. I was like, oh, man, I, I'm so looking forward to this. But then again, I like these kind of spices. I've had dishes, you know, made like, say, for instance, in India with a lot of cinnamon and, uh, and curry. No, there's no curry in this. I'm using that as an example. <laughs> with the cinnamon and the allspice. Um, so, well, that's just it. it. Cinnamon is not a sweet spice either it has its own it has its own scent so as i said i did throw in some brown sugar but then again a lot of people throw brown sugar in their chili anyway brown sugar is a pretty standard uh ingredient for many many barbecue sauces also i did not go overboard with the brown sugar so i am not going to say this is a sweet chili I also used only a little bit of cayenne in it, though, so this is also not going to be a set-your-mouth-on-fire chili. Oops, better check those uh, dogs again. <laughs> yeah, 
I have to keep running back and forth between the, uh, you know, behind the camera here. It looks like one of these dogs is already getting just to the point of charring. Two of them are, in fact. I think it's time to bring out a plate for these things, in fact. Let's turn off the heat here. But there we go. That's how easy it is to cook hot dogs in cast iron. And as I said, once you have had hot dogs cooked in cast iron, you will never be satisfied with boiled hot dogs ever again. Or at least I'm not. Let me quickly grab a plate for these things. There we go. Actually, I better turn the heat back on because I got to toast the buns. Can't forget that. My bad. Oops, also my bad. I forgot the tongs. <laughs> I'm going to give this some chili just a few more minutes and then I think we'll be ready. May have just barely begun to <laughs> overdo the hot dogs. That's okay. As I said, that's just charring. <laughs> Still, yeah, some nice hot dogs. Hmm. Even if the chili doesn't turn out well, I've got some dogs. And I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> and a little bit more stirring here. Which means our next step. About the last thing we do, I guess, before it's time to serve the chili. And that would be toast our buns. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because, of course, you know the chicks really go for a guy who has hot buns. Mm. And I think I can fit a third one in here at least. That's all right. I'm not going to make eight chili dogs. Especially since it's really only myself and Jamie. Or my roommate, I'm sorry. There we go. While we're at it, got to get out the cheese. <laughs> as we're waiting, keep stirring this stuff. Yeah, this is actually looking pretty good, I think. Try to lower this, there we go. What do you think, folks? I'd say this is probably at the point where we could probably serve it. So, I, as I said, once these buns are done, I think we will be ready to serve. Thank you again for your patience here. Hope I didn't interrupt your Friday night. I'm thinking more likely you probably kept this video in the background while you did your stuff, which is fine. I just appreciate everybody who has uh, stuck around here. There we go, that's not bad. And actually, let me quickly break out my phone. Because of course, you know, got to get a couple of pictures of this. There we go. Thank you so much. We better check these. Uh, I keep, I have to keep running back and forth here. And yeah, just barely. Probably should have used a bigger pan for this, in fact, but it'll do. Besides, we're going to be covering this in chili anyway. Okay, finally. 
boy out of the fridge. The rest of the onions. Along with shredded cheddar. And yes, I know it's better to shred your own. I didn't have the time for it. As I told you, I've been very busy these past couple of days. It's really nothing wrong with shredded cheese. It'll still melt, especially in something as hot as this chili here. Oh yeah, I think I could stand all night just ugh, smelling this. I love the smell of this, boy. And let's see what else we have here. Yeah, it's definitely an acquired taste, says Connie Tom. I've never found anyone who thinks it's just okay. They either like it or hate it. It's also, also Cincinnati chili is Greek, I believe it, which explains the Mediterranean uh, spices used in it, you know, such as, well, again, we've got the, such as the uh, cinnamon, you know, the Middle Eastern spice, I should say. And also for an authentic Cincinnati cheese coney, don't forget the mustard. Mustard goes directly in the hot dogs before adding the chili. Thank you for your thank you. Let me get that out of the uh, up, out of the fridge right now. Leak did it go? There it is. Uh, no, there it isn't. Oh, there it is. Here we are. Thank you for the reminder. Here is our wimpy yellow mustard. Yeah, I grew up with wimpy yellow mustard. I, it's still my favorite mustard. I like Dijon, but given a choice, I will grab the wimpy yellow mustard. All right. This is, oh boy, this thing is steaming hot too. <laughs> also, you burn the dogs, man. Maybe a little bit. There's a little bit of char on the surface. I don't deny that. They're still edible. I have no, I'm not really going to complain. And also, a couple of them are burned, but a lot of them are not. So, <laughs> I'm not going to n deny things like accidentally burning the hot dogs here. I've said many times I'm just an amateur will probably be an amateur for the rest of my life. Nonetheless, I will just have those burned ones myself. There's plenty here that are not burned that I will gladly serve to uh, guests and roomies. But yeah, at this point, I would say at this point, this chili is definitely done. Heat goes off. Now for the fun part. Move these over here. That means better break out another plate. There we go. Time now to change our view. And here we go. Actually, I think I'll change this over a little bit. Thank you again for your patience. So that that way I can still have a bit. Yeah, this is not a bad view right, right here. Move the mic a little closer. And with that, it's time to get some paschetti. That's still hot. <laughs> okay. So, how are we going to do this? Uh, where the bleak did my oven mitts go? Here they are. Okay. Thank you for waiting, folks. I'm sorry that we're just staring at an empty plate right now. Here we go. Yeah. There we go. There's, some, there's something to look at. Come on. I, 
a little bit congealed. That's all right. The chili will take care of that. Mm. Straighten this out. Oh, and here's yet another thing about Cincinnati chili. When you eat it, do not twirl the spaghetti on your fork. This apparently is one of those little bones of contention that they have. So I must remember not to do it myself. As being of Italian descent, that's almost like blasphemy. And now, that's step one. Step two comes... Let's see. Okay, here is we go. Ladle. Ladle, 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 ladle. Oh, of all the times for I can't do it. Okay, I'm sorry about that, but one second, let me quickly send a uh, text here. All right, um, texting. I am in the middle of something right now, comma. Please wait a few minutes, full stop. Okay, sorry about that. Anyway, as I was saying, here we go. Here comes our Cincinnati chili. Nice dark color to it. I like this. That's number two. Now comes number three. The onions. Actually, we should probably dig out. There we are. Number three is the onions. I think I'd better do a photo of this before I put on the cheese. Oh, God. Work is demanding that I call now at 9.30 on a Friday night. Okay. Finally. Best of all, the cheese. <laughs> Drown it in cheese. I better watch those buns. I hope I didn't burn those buns. Okay, turn that off right now. Always something. Damn it. Damn it, damn it, damn it. Oh, man. Okay, well, I'll have to manage the buttons here. Nonetheless, this is our result, folks. Hope you appreciate it. I think I may have overdone it with the cheese, but nonetheless, here is our Cincinnati chili. Somewhere in there, there is the chili. We have the pasta on the bottom, the chili, the onions, and the cheese. And now that we've done that, let's see. Tim Riddle says, ah, uh, boy, no, busted bass. How my life has changed. It's Friday night and I'm laying here watching some dude make chili and spaghetti on the internet. Hey, welcome to the 21st century. Tim Riddle says, I grew up in Northwest Ohio. Never heard of it until I went south of Dayton. You order it two-way, three-way, or four-way. And what we have here is a four-way. Pasta, chili, onions, and cheese. And with that... Oh, we are getting late, and like it or not, I'm going to have to call work. Ugh. So, all we can do now is try it. And that means, again, I do not, repeat, do not, there you go, do not twirl 
the pasta. As a result, here we are. Now to try it. Mm. Mm. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Folks, all I can say is I like it. Mm. Oh, man. Nah. Mm. Well, oh, yeah. I like it. Oh, it definitely, the cayenne is giving it just a little bit of heat in the background. This is not sweet. I'll have you know, this is, since I hope it's Cincinnati chili. I hope anyone from Cincinnati appreciates that. Oh, look at the way the fork's standing up. But, man, I like it. Next time I'm going to Cincinnati, you better believe I'll be having some of this. Wow. Huh. <laughs> Mm. Don't stir it. Just cut through the noodles and grab a bite. Yes, exactly. Whoops. Sorry about that. Let's, let's do that right now. Cut through the noodles. Have another bite. Mm. 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 Oh, yeah. Mm. This has everything. Is the meat? No, it is not sweet. Crunch from the onions and the cheese. Oh man, I am liking this. I am definitely giving this a thumbs up. I really, really like this, folks. All I can say is try this one way or another at some point. Go to Cincinnati and try it. Try making it yourself. You can see it's really not that hard. Took a while, yes, and this has gone, good grief, an hour and 36 minutes. But that is the result, and here we have Cincinnati chili. I do hope you like this. And same bookworm, where is everyone? Where is everyone? Well, it's 9.30 on a Friday night. That's not the same as a Wednesday night. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, that's why I guess if nothing else, you can really, really appreciate everybody who has shown up, like Bookworm73 and Jessica T. And Connie Tom, don't stir it. Oh, yeah, I said that part. Tim Riddle, it's gross. Um, no, it may look it, but it does not taste it. I'm going to finish this. No, no difficulty at all. The only reason I'm not tearing into it right now is because, well, I'm talking here and I'm going to have to call work. But nonetheless, there we go. This is our Cincinnati chili cooked in a large enamel Dutch oven. Wait, I still got to try the dogs, too, but it is getting kind of late and unfortunately I have to call work. So... Friday nights are much more interesting, obviously. Yeah, I can't deny that. So <laughs> that's why, I, That's why again, we're going to have to follow up with this uh, next Wednesday when I will do the subject of baking in cast iron, as I mentioned. So I very much appreciate everybody here, nonetheless, though, and I do hope you've enjoyed this. As I said, please, please post your comments. I really appreciate the comments, probably more than anything else. But above all else, this was a lot of fun, and I like the results. I'm going to finish this without any difficulty at all. And I would like to see folks give it a try. And having said that, well, nonetheless, thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you for uh, taking the time to watch here tonight. And we'll see you all next Wednesday. Have a good evening.